Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimruttshow.com. That's jimruttshow.com. Today's guests are Nick Chater and Morton Christensen. Nick is Professor of Behavioral Science at the University of Warwick School of Business, and Morton is the William R. Keenan Professor of Psychology at Cornell University and a professor in the Cognitive Science of Language at Aarhus University in Denmark, if I didn't mangle that too badly. Nick was on the show in EP57 to talk about his book, The Mind is Flat, which radically debunks depth psychology and lots more. I got to tell you, this is one of my favorite all-time episodes. So if you like some of the things you hear here, check it out. It's a really mind-bending episode. Morton and I interacted a bit when Morton was a sabbatical visitor at Santa Fe Institute. I've been reading the papers that Nick and Morton have been writing together for almost 25 years, so it's really great to have them on the show together. Welcome, Nick and Morton. That's great to be here. Yeah, wonderful to be here. Yeah, this is this should be a lot of fun. I must say, I really like the book. And for the audience, this book is quite readable. You don't need a background in cognitive science or computational linguistics or anything like that. The highly intelligent listeners of the Jim Rutt Show ought to be able to handle it just fine. And it's actually a lot of fun. The title of the book is The Language Game, How Improvisation Created Language and Changed the World. That's what we're going to talk about today. Before we get down into the book, let's drill into an analogy that y'all use a whole lot, and that is the game of charades. As it turns out, you probably don't even know this. Maybe you do. You use the term 197 times. And of course, it's a small group social game and one I'm familiar with from popular culture, but maybe somewhat surprisingly, one I've never actually played. Not a thing in my hometown, not a thing in my adult face-to-face communities, I expect there's probably some others out there. So because you use it so much and it's so central to your argument, maybe one of you could take a minute or so and describe in a little detail how the game of charades works. Well, shall shall I take that? Yeah, so so charades, which is something that's quite a big part of my family culture, actually, the kind of thing we used to play with my grandparents when I was a small child. It's a game where you try to convey either a book or a movie or a play or an opera or a song, and you do it purely by gesture. So you can't use, you can't speak, and you can't make sounds. So you think of something like, say, we, I think we're talking in the book about King Kong. And you think, well, King Kong, how are we going to do that? And you might think, well, I'll imitate a, 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 some sort of group gorilla. And if you're thinking a bit more about it, you might think, oh, and if I can get the Empire State Building in, that would be good. And maybe I can even try to swat at some aeroplanes. Of course, the person who's watching this has got to figure out, what on earth is this? What is this thing you're getting at? And sometimes it, it works, and it's you know, very satisfying. And sometimes it's hilariously disastrous. So you, know, you think, it's so clear. It's King Kong. And there's all kinds of crazy stuff about, you know, I don't know, slasher films or psycho, or there's all kinds of you know, wild guesses. But the miraculous thing about sh- charades is that we actually quite quickly get attuned to each other. So so one of the things that's so interesting, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, is that if we played charades a lot with each other, there are certain things we start to do repeatedly. So for example, if we did King Kong successfully, then if you needed to do something, some charade about it, something with an ape in it or something with, with a big building in it, for that matter, you, you might well find yourself starting with that charade and then sort of making a variation. So you'd be saying, oh, this is, the, this, is the, you know, this is Gorilla. We've got that straight. And on to the, you know, now let's make some variation. And then if you did yet another thing, you might draw on several. You might draw, draw on several of your previous charades. And gradually you're building up this kind of little library just for two of you, just in this, you know, sometimes in the space of sort of 20 minutes or half an hour. But that's a very interesting phenomenon, of course. It's very interesting and relevant for the way communication develops. And that's, that's, that's our idea. Yeah, well, we're, we'll relate to that again a few times, I'm sure. But I think it would be very useful just so people understand with some precision what it is. Now, let's hop into the book itself. And, you know, you start off talking about the significance of language to what it means to be human. Yeah, one of the things that that often underappreciated because we use language all the time and oftentimes we don't really think about it, but it is crucial for almost everything we do. It's crucial for you know using the internet, it's crucial for establishing laws, 
society more generally, norms that we live by, and so on. So without language, we wouldn't really be able to be where we are today, for better or worse. And and so in evolutionary terms, having evolved the ability to use language, that really changes the game because now we can start to develop cumulative culture. That is, we can build on what other generations sort of created before, and that allows us to have improved skills, improved facilities throughout societies and just in the way we live with each other. Yeah, and I think the thing is, it's so hard to imagine life without language. And I know at the beginning of the book, we talk about how it would be if language suddenly disappeared. And obviously, we'd be you know, desperately struggling to, to maintain the lives we have now because we'd, almost all communication would be extremely painful. We'd be using charades, in fact, the entire, pretty much the entire time for everything. But if you'd never had language in the first place, going back to what Morton was saying about accumulation of knowledge, Every generation of learners pretty much would have to learn from scratch. So I, I would face the world as kind of a lone, isolated being, thinking, well, you know, there's, there's lots of weird stuff's happening. The world's very complicated. I've got to find food. I've got to find shelter. I've got to avoid being eaten. And I can watch other people, and they might try to give me hints. But without, with, as soon as we have language, we can say, this is, you know, this is, how, this is where that particular type of you know, a, a prey animal tends to be. This ice is dangerous. Don't walk on it. You know, this is how to build a shelter. We can instruct each other. We can also create, as Morton was saying, we can create norms and rules for each other. We can say, you know, we mustn't do this, or you did that, and that's wrong. So we can start to build cohesive patterns of rules and laws that bind us together as, as, as teams and as, as ultimately as societies. And that sort of accumulation of knowledge, I mean, we tend to think of it as, as in terms of libraries. And of course, that's also super important. The fact that we can write stuff down is, requires language. But without language at all, there's no, no question of writing something down or, or, or even an oral tradition. There's simply every discovery is sort of immediately lost. So it really is fundamental to building a, a complex, rich society such as humans have. And without, no other creature has language and, our, and no other creature has a society remotely as flexible and complicated as ours. Yeah, it's always seemed to me that language is one of those fairly rare bright lines, right? At least language of our sort. And we're not quite sure what the whales and dolphins and such are doing, but our sort of language compared to the other primates, it goes, you know, Mr. Chip and us share 98.5% of the same chromosomes, and he's not a dumb guy. In some ways, he's smarter than we are, interestingly, in certain kinds of psychological tests. But I don't see him flying around in a 787s. And so that bright line has made, it's made a gigantic difference. Now, when I'm reading books for podcasts, I often look for a single, fairly concise theme in the book. And I think I found one surprisingly early. I'm going to run it by you guys and get you to react to it. This is Rutt's hypothesis of the deep theme of the book. The fundamental misconception that the rough and tumble of everyday language is a pale shadow of an ideal language where words have clear meanings and are put together following well-defined grammatical rules. But this traditional story has things exactly backward. Real languages are not slightly mangled variants of a pure, more orderly linguistic system. Instead, actual language is always a matter of improvisation, of finding an effective way to meet the communication demands of the moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think all I can say is spot on. Absolutely. When we were thinking about the early drafts of the book, one of the, thing, one of the ways into it, which we didn't ultimately major on, but was starting with the idea of a perfect language. So, I mean, we thought a lot about the history and looked quite a lot of the history of the idea that there is some kind of ideal language from which real languages have, as it were, sort of pale and broken copies. And of course, the Tower of Babel story in the Bible is an example of this, all these sort of mangled tongues that we actually speak and the diversity and the, mis the sort of misunderstandings we have through the variety of languages is assumed to have been a sort of visited upon us as a punishment for overweening hubris. But prior to that, the assumption was there was a single and presumably perfected archetypal language. But that's a very broad idea. It pops up just about everywhere. And the one sense of the perfect language, one viewpoint of the perfect language is historical. So the idea is that once upon a time, there was this old, you know, ur language, which we all spoke, and its you know, decline has set in, and it's just scattered, broken into a million pieces. But another perspective is to think that the real language, the real sort of ultimate ground language is, is the language in which we think. So the assumption going back to, in fact, to some extent Chomsky, but certainly to Jerry Fodor especially, is that the Jerry Fodor is a very significant philosopher and, and psychologist of the 60s, 70s, and very brilliant person, but a very different perspective on the world to ours. And his view was that there's a language of thought, and that language of thought would be much more unambiguous, clear-cut, 
generally co cohesive than the languages we actually speak, and that human languages are a kind of, you can probably put it like this, but they're a kind of, sort of mangled version of this sort of rather precisely defined, logically coherent inner language, which we could only, as it were, glimpse through the, the veil of the rather mangled actual languages we use. Well, an awful Platonist view of reality, and I must say I always put my flag down with the Aristotelians, right? I remember talking with Ray Jackendorf about this when he was at the Santa Fe Institute back in the double aughts. And he was, at least at that time, still somewhat of an adherent to mental ease. And I must say, I wasn't buying it at all, even though he's a way smarter guy than I am. But even really smart guys can be wrong. Yeah, the idea of the perfect language is, has been around for, as Nick was saying, a really long time. And it's actually a wonderful book by Umberto Eco called The Perfect Language, where he goes through all the different kinds of ideas people have had throughout the centuries about the perfect language. And the notion is that, there's, that there has to be something essential to language that's captured in some way, whether divined on us by you know, some sort of God or whether it's sort of built in in our genes as in a universal grammar as suggested by Chomsky or something like that. But it's not taking the messiness of actual real language into account. And th this is where sort of the, some of the inspiration actually come from what you just mentioned from the, for being at the Santa Fe Institute, this notion that language is really more like a self-organizing system, which is of course a key topic at the Santa Fe Institute. All right, let's hop into the first story that you tell. And for the listeners, this book is full of stories. It's actually very enjoyable to read, and you'll get some really good ideas from the stories. And that's the encounter between Captain Cook and the crew of the HMS Endeavor in 1769 with some indigenous folks. As best I can tell, we're in the south end of Latin America, South America someplace. Why don't you tell us that story and how it relates? Yeah, it's a wonderful sort of part of history in that I think it was around January in 69 where HMS Endeavour were on their way, was on their way to Tahiti where they're going to record sort of the transit of Venus. And before they rounded the southern tip of South America, they needed to get some water and some wood. And so they put in at the Bay of Good Success on the Chair del Fuego, the southern tip of South America. And then when they came ashore, they so some indigenous people, most likely the house, we don't know exactly you know, who they were, but it was most likely the house. And at first, they disappeared again. But then two men from Cook's party, they sort of stood aside. And then two people, two men from the house party, then came towards them. And this is sort of the incredible thing. They, they had some sticks, and they held them out in front of them, and then threw them aside. And that was... Cook and his men took that as an indication that they had peaceful intention. And indeed, that was the case because soon they were you know, trading gifts and they were sharing food. And, and they even, some of the house even came aboard the endeavor. And subsequently, they, the house helped Cook find water and so on. So it's an amazing interaction, even though, of course, they had absolutely no language in common. And in fact, the house would probably look very odd from the viewpoint of the Europeans, but also the Europeans would look incredibly weird from the viewpoint of the house. Yet, very quickly, they were able to communicate with one another in what we in the book calls, you know, sort of high stakes, cross-cultural linguistic, or not linguistic, but cross-cultural charades. Great. And then as we talk about how, not maybe in this case, but in other cases where one society contacts the other that are particularly where they're very separate linguistic groups and have nothing in common with vocabulary or syntax, pigeons often emerge. If you could tell us what pigeons are and how they can then lead to creoles. Yeah. So the, the idea of a, a pigeon, I mean, pigeons are, are languages which we don't really have a very coherent syntax. So they're they take vocabulary items from one or primarily one, but sometimes a mix of both languages, of so the languages of the two sides. And in, in reality, this is very frequently documented in the case of, of empire. So one powerful nation is subjugating a people and essentially forcing them to work at their behest. And not usually a symmetrical relationship at all. It's usually rather grim. So that's usually pretty grim. But the, because the requirement to communicate with people you're wanting to work for you requires that you have a common set of nouns and verbs for our sort of actions and, and things. So initially, 
the it, it, as it were on first contact and fairly soon after that a fairly ad hoc set of conventions get picked up usually driving as i say from the vocabulary of one or both languages and the, the syntax is very minimal so these there's no really there's not, you don't have the complicated structure of a language of a familiar language like english however the children interestingly the children of groups where a pidgin is spoken start to produce something much richer so they start to develop complicated ways of putting words together so they don't just allow you to just to spew out nouns and verbs in whatever order which gets your message across you suddenly find there's a the word all starts to appear and then all kinds of other things like morphology might start to appear and so gradually the language gets more and more complicated and so you'll get and that's known as a creole so after, after a generation or two the like that something really language like is emerging from something which was originally just a sort of a bit like a sort of a, a salad of words. So this seems to imply kind of a remarkable natural human ability to create, to organize linguistic structure where there wasn't one, a new linguistic entity out of rather unpromising beginnings. Yeah, very, really interesting. It does seem to show the power of a language instinct of some sort, even though we're gonna, we'll talk later, you guys don't buy the Pinker or Chomsky style. I was actually, when I was reading that, I was, had a curious question to self. Have there ever been any examples where cultures ended up staying at the pigeon level and that became the language of a people? Does that, has that happened anywhere? I believe there are some some languages that are pidgin. They actually become more complex than they are initially, but there are some languages that are referred to as still as pidgins and have, you know, a substantial number of speakers. So these days the this some of the distinctions between creoles and pidgins are a bit more fluid than people used to think. But I think talk pixin is an example of what is still referred to as a pigeon. Interesting. I was just curious about it. It doesn't really fit into the rest of your story. It was just, I say, I got these guys here, might as well ask them, right? One of the things I noticed throughout the book is that you often balance oral language and sign language. In fact, you use the word sign or sign 91 times, mostly to refer to signing a few times in semiotic sense, but usually for signing. Michael Tomasello is well known for his theories that perhaps gestures came before language. What do you all think about that? Well, at least when it comes to sort of the, the origin, it's probably hard to know unless we can get hold of a time machine or something like that. But there has been in the, in the literature, sort of either has been suggested that, oh, it's all language originated in gestures, or somebody else is suggesting that it are originated in vocal utterances. But what Tomasello in particular was suggesting was he presented this thought experiment where he imagined that, okay, imagine we take two groups of kids and we, pres we put them on different islands. And then on one island, they're only able to use gestures to communicate, no sounds, no speech, no nothing. On the other island, they're, let's call the first island gesture island. And then on the other island, let's call that vocalization island. They're only allowed to use vocalizations, not speech as such, but just vocalization, but no gestures. And what he was suggesting that only on the gesture island would these children be able to communicate with each other to any degree, because his intuition was that sound itself doesn't carry much meaning as such. It's hard to get it independently of words to carry any meaning. However, there's a very smart psychologist, Marcus Perlman from Birmingham University in the UK, who did a, an interesting study where he had all sort of people interested in language evolution create essentially sounds that should correspond to something like a tiger or cutting or water or something like that. And then he, these sort of sounds were entered into a contest and the people who could best pr produce non-speech sounds that would capture some sort of, some of these uh, concepts like cutting or tiger, they would win a $1,000 prize. And they took the best examples and then presented them to a bunch of people who didn't know nothing about what this was about. And then they had to guess when they heard a sound like whether what that referred to. And there was sort of a bunch of pictures that they would then click on the tiger. And it turns out that people could do this quite well. And they even did it cross-culturally and cross-linguistically across a number of different countries around the world, including indigenous people. And they were able to find that sound can carry some aspects of meaning, even in the absence of words and gestures. And, and I think that's very interesting when you think about the charade, because when you're playing playing charades, you get, get a sense of just how amazingly 
rich our repertoire of gestures is and how you, you can imitate a, a very elderly person or a bear or a, or somebody doing some cutting or an umbrella or all these things. You can create a sort of an image, a visual picture in the mind of the, the, the viewer, which can conjure up the right concept. And it's easy to think from that, that what sounds would be hopeless. And this is Thomas Ellow's intuition and mine as well. Well, you know, what your language is great when you have words, but without words, these noises will be no good. So a kind of noise charade, which noise charades would not be nearly as effective. And what Perlman's showing is that noise charades is much more effective than you might imagine. So, so it's not really so clear that, I mean, if it were the case that noise, noise charades was, was very poor, it would be a pretty powerful indirect argument that communication most likely would have started gesturally. Well, that's an interesting data point that points the other direction, makes it even more confusing, right? Yeah, yeah that's funny. Uh, another SFI guy and I, a guy named Walter Fontana, one night over a bottle of whiskey, we're doing what you're not supposed to do, is you talk about the origin of language. It was one of the French research institutes, banned the topic for 100 years or something like that. But anyway, we were talking about it, and we came up with our crackpot theory of the night, which was language may have evolved from multi-part tools. Because assembling, creating and assembling a multi-part tool has a syntax and a grammar to it, right? And a semantics. And so he said the mental machinery for building multi-part tools was the bootstrapper. And obviously there's an evolutionary payoff, right? And if you want genes to pull forward, let's have a payoff. I can make multi-part tools. I kill more, reproduce better. My genes survive. And so that was the bootstrap to rudimentary syntax, grammar, and semantics. And then we also took a leap into the void and said, hmm, gestures on how to make tools might have been the precursor to language. I'm not sure if anybody else has ever come up with that crackpot theory, but an investment of one bottle of cheap whiskey, and that's what we came up with. <laughs> that's a, quite a good payoff. I mean, I, this, is, I mean this relates to much more to Morton's line of research than mine, but I think it is very interesting that the sort of hierarchical structure of sequences of actions in general, multiple tools being a particularly you know, a case where you have to generate particularly complex sequences of actions, but human action sequences in general have a hierarchical form. So something like making dinner is this multi-stage task with all these different sub-components, which have to be interleaved in complicated ways, and you have to go back and forwards, and they have different levels of complexity. So there's you know, kind of you know, slice onions, but then there's indiv individual slices, and then there's a you know, move onions into frying pan and wiggle frying pan, and so on it goes. And that that, that necessity to, to be able to build those complicated highly hierarchical structures does, you know, it, it is interesting to think how analogous that is to the ability to create complex structured sentences. And I know, Morton, you've looked at this kind of question, how much the, the hierarchical structure of non-linguistic sequences and linguistic sequences may connect. So you might want to say a little bit about that. Yes. I mean, also just to note, there are researchers who have suggested that sort of language in part of piggybacking on top of abilities for tool construction. So there's Dietrich Stout at Emory University has done some work on that, including newer imaging. But I think more generally, there, there, there does seem to be some overlap between action sequences and sort of human language, at least the, the structured language. But it's also important to keep in mind that, for example, in the production of language, as well as in action sequences, it's always very flexible. So you're not really planning necessarily very far ahead because if you're reaching for something you know you have to adjust your reach in some way if it's heavy or if it's light more than you had expected likewise with language oftentimes we feel like we're sort of speaking into the void as it were that you know we have some ideas what we want to say but the specific structure or the specific combination of words that we words that we use are often something that we sort of fill in on the fly and also you know going back to the notion of gesture versus vocalization i think perhaps the most clear answer might be that it's actually a combination of the two because there's disadvantages and advantages with both. So by combining them, it would seem that our ancestors, when they started communicating in more complex ways, that they very likely recruited both sound as well as gestures just because you could you can make yourself more easily understood that way yeah in terms of charades just think how much great better you could be if one one team was allowed to use words and the other wasn't right so both is like so often in the social sciences the seemingly obvious answer well, let's move on here this is into the history of ideas a little bit in the uh, post-world war Two era, we started seeing first slowly, then more rapidly, the proliferation of computers and computer networking. And then soon thereafter, the development of a cognitive science revolution that in some sense tried to apply network and computational models to human cognition. You guys argue that 
there was something wrong with that, as it turns out, at least with respect to language. So why don't you tell that story a little bit and where it connects to your work? Yeah, well, just to kick off, the starting point from the point of view of the understanding of language that you have, if you think about it as a communicating between computers over a network, is you, you think that the objective is to take the information in one computer and so package it up into a digital form, and digital could be binary stream, or it could be a stream of sounds, and to send that, in one case across a network, another case, another, another case it would be an acoustic signal, to another machine, another person or another computer, and then it decodes at the other end. So there's a kind of, it, it, you take a, some, some, some information you want to transmit, a text file or a, or a movie, and you turn it into a, a message in compress, some kind of compressed form, and send it across the channel, and then there's a, the, the opposite process of decoding goes on at the other end. And that seems like a very natural way to think. And indeed, there's a beautiful theory of how that works, how rapidly it can be done, and so on, developed by the sort of mathematical and engineering genius, Lord Shannon. Now, Shannon himself, actually, was very skeptical that this was a particularly good analogy for language. In fact, he particularly stressed that his theory, communication theory, is all about all the aspects of communication which don't have anything to do with meaning. So, so he wasn't himself at all arguing that this was the right way to think about, about how meaning is conveyed between one person and another. Nonetheless, as a field, I think we have implicitly imbibed this message. So the idea that you get in your mind if you take this viewpoint is you think, well, if we're going to have a way of coding up thoughts and turning them into language and decoding, decoding them again, what we want is a clear, precise, formal system for doing this. So we need to have some mathematically kind of... Um, well-defined mapping. It needs to be invertible, obviously. It needs to be able to go in both directions. And it can't afford to have too many inherent ambiguities and vaguenesses. And it, to the extent that it's being pushed around by context and continually sort of reshaped by the particular situation you're in, that's a bug. That's not a feature. That's a bug. Because you want the thing to be as stable as possible. Now, human communication is really, well, this is where go back to charades again, it seems to be really different from that. So first of all, it's not really clear that there's a crystalline thought in my, as it were, my mental ease, my language of thought, that I'm trying to get into your mental ease. So the starting point, but there's a kind of thing, there's a file, as it were, in my brain, and I want to get that file into your brain. That itself is a, you know, a, a, probably a, a poor model of what's actually happening. But what we're doing when we're using language, using communication, and language emerges from this process, is we're, we're, we're playing this charade-like game. So I'm thinking... I want you to think about King Kong. Now, you will have a different conception of King Kong to me, you know, different things about the movie and the, you know, the background and the, was there a novel? I don't even know. So we'll have different background knowledge, but all I want you to do is to pick out this name just as I will. And I'm going to use whatever tricks I can. So I'm going to try waving my swat, doing some swatting planes. I'm going to try to mine the Empire State Building shape. And I'm going to do all kinds of stuff, which I'm hoping one of these things is going to get across to you the concept of King Kong. But of course, I'm not doing it in some standardized way. I haven't got a standardized method saying this is how I encode King Kong in all situations. And in fact, the method I use might depend crucially, as we were saying before, on what I just told, what we were just chatting about before. It will also depend crucially on what I think you know. Now, indeed, for that matter, what I know. So if I know you're an old movie buff, then I think, ah, this is going to be easy. But if, I, if, you're, if I'm doing charades to a, a small child, I'm think, I may think, ah, they may actually know who King Kong is. This is going to be, or they know about the Empire State Building. This is going to be tough. So I've got to read, so the message is being continually reshaped based on the particular context, the particular communicative interaction. So it's inherently moment by moment, a local thing. I'm trying to solve a communicative problem right here, right now with you to communicate this thing. I just have to be very precise. I just have to get across enough. So in the game, back to your example of the multi-tool part tool construction, if we're making a tool together, I don't have to give you, I don't have to have to have a code that's precise enough to convey instructions for all possible tools. And if I say, you know, pass me the mallet, say, it doesn't have to be an answer to the question, but what exactly is a mallet? Under all possible objects I might give you, is this a mallet? What about that one? All that matters is that there's only three things on the table. I want that one. That's all I care about. <laughs> so the, the, the context specific, the, the moment by moment, solving the communicative problem that's right in front of me now, using all the intelligence and creativity that both of us have together, that's the trick. There's no code that the gesture and the waving and the noises I make, including link, using everyday language. This is not equivalent to converting, some, converting my message into a kind of logical, crystalline, crystal clear language which has a kind of stable interpretation. Instead, I, I am doing, it's charades all the way down. It's charades which it gets more and more standardized and conventionalized, and the more we talk to each other, the more 
it becomes similar. And of course, we were acculturated into a lot of other charade users from birth. So the language is continually becoming more, in many ways, more, more refined and more precise. But it's always a process of flexible moment by moment interaction. Yeah, I thought a very nice metaphor that you guys used that brought forth the charadishness of language was the iceberg, right? That, and also some examples like a very, the iceberg meaning you have words, phrases, and sentences above the waterline and below it is all of our experiences, our memories, our empathy, our culture, our factual knowledge, right? You know, and some rudimentary ability to do logic that we know humans are particularly good at that particular topic, but at least we have modest skills at it. You gave a very interesting thought piece. Three short sentences. For sale, baby shoes never worn. Tie that back to the metaphor of the iceberg. Yeah, that, that is sort of a very evocative piece of what's called flash fiction. And so when you first hear those six words, it's hard not to sort of concoct some sort of story about devastated parents having lost their child due to illness or something else. And then they have to, they're poor, or so they have to sell these baby shoes that so lovingly bought for this little child. But of course, none of this, none of this information is in the six words that you just read aloud, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. And it, with regard to the communicative iceberg, the idea is that language is a collaborative endeavor. So when we are communicating with one another, we are sort of collaborating to create a common understanding between us. And where the iceberg comes in is the notion is that without our ability to have empathy, the knowledge of common norms, social mores, general knowledge, and so on, and just how we interact with knowledge about how we interact with one another, we would not be able to understand one another. We certainly would not be able to make any sense of this little six-word story. And so from the viewpoint of the sort of communication iceberg, the idea is that what allows us to use words, phrases, sentences to communicate is really having all this hidden knowledge, the knowledge that's under the surface, so to speak. And without that, our words wouldn't make any sense and it would just sort of sink into unintelligibility. Nick, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I suppose that highlights the, how different this kind of communication across the network perspective is from the way language works. So if you're, you naturally think you're going to communicate across the network, then you've got to have some kind of standardized protocol and it's all you know, precisely defined, and you know, every packet of information has a, a well-defined way to be decoded. Whereas, and so, and the message that you're pulling out has been, as it were, bottled and put passed down the wire. So, so there's no magic kind of creative license on the part of the decoder. The decoder is not supposed to think, well, you didn't actually say, here's a ton of stuff, but uh, I'm going to think that I'm going to infer all that stuff. But real communication is all about that inferring process. I mean, going back to our charades with King Kong, you, to even work out what we're even talking about, you have to do all this infer inferring, all this reasoning and, and creative thinking. Yeah, there's some, there's some obvious proof. I was God, just thinking about this as you were saying this. You know, How could anybody not notice this? Think of the concept of marital misunderstandings, right? <laughs> where, where you don't get it right, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah I mean, the human, human I mean, misunderstandings are, are, are in that context and every other. I mean, they are, they are the bane of our lives, aren't they? And in fact, in a way, the very fact that communication, I mean, communication is it's endlessly difficult. I think it's something you know, if you if you spend your life, as we all do, spending a lot of time creating documents, creating you know, podcasts, you know, trying to communicate clearly, in a way that, very large part of the entire human experience is devoted to the struggle to, to get one's ideas across clearly. And if one imagines that language is simply a matter of a bit like a programming language or some sort of code, then you think, well, once you've got the code down, I mean, it should be easy. You just think the thoughts and you just translate them into the code. I mean, why is it so difficult? But of course, it is an endless challenge in the, because it's a fundamentally creative process and a collaborative process. And of course, disharmony arises in close relationships where it fails. And I think one of the reasons it, it, it particularly causes disharmony is that in a close relationship, the assumption is you know each other so well, surely there couldn't be any misunderstandings. And the fact that there's misunderstandings is particularly <laughs> annoying. How could you have thought this? Do you know me at all? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Stephen King yeah. wrote a really good book. Stephen King, the, you know, the horror writer, who's actually a damn good writer, despite what anybody might say. He wrote a great book called On Writing, where he talks about this, but he uses different language, where he sends, you essentially have to mind read the other person. And I think what he meant was you have to make some guess on what the underwater part of their iceberg looks like. And then in a relatively economical fashion, 
project into their brain what you have in your brain and hope that it lands. And sometimes it doesn't. And so let's get on to the next reason that makes this even harder. And this is, I love this part because it just makes so much sense and it ties in closely to well-supported laboratory research, which is the now or never bottleneck. You guys talk about the working memory limits, which are, you know, sort of popularly known as seven plus or minus two, you know, nine is Einstein and five is George W. Bush. And <laughs> in reality, I think the more recent research shows the number's more like four or five, I think, something like that. But anyway, this turns out and it turns out to be an amazing bottleneck for this Stephen King experiment of having only li- a little porthole to send these signals across to activate the underwater part of the iceberg. Take it away, gentlemen. Yeah, well, shall I, shall I start off? I mean, this is a, well, something we both have lots of thoughts on, but just to start off, I re- the, one of the amazing psychology experiments that really struck us was that if you give people sequences of random sounds, it's on beats and clocks and bangs, and you give people, say, four or five of these sounds over a period of, say, a second, people have real trouble remembering even what order they occurred in. I mean, also what they were, but what order they were in. So you'd think, well, this is very strange. So you present sounds at roughly the rate that we say for speech sounds, and they seem to be just an uninterpretable jumble. And if you make that sequence more than four or five, it's just you've completely lost it. You've got no idea what the sounds even were. So that's really weird because it seems to imply that you think it would imply that if we try to uh, communicate with each other by sending these arbitrary sounds, just noises which happen to be speech noises, we'd be baffled. We wouldn't be able to hold on to them. We just we wouldn't know what order they were in. We wouldn't know what they were. So a thought, the trick to get around this is that is, is that the brain has to take those sequences and make sense of them as larger sequences. It has to see them as chunks. It has to think, hang on, I've seen this sequence of noises before. This is the word tiger, say. It isn't just a random set of noises. And it also has to realize that particular parts of the speech sound can be interpreted as a t sound and, a, and the g sound and so on. So it has to do that quickly. Because if it doesn't do that quickly, more sounds are coming. And because of this limitation of four or five, is you know, we're maxed out with four or five, unless we can, under, unless we can interpret as we go. We maxed out with four or five random noises. So after my, so but after four or five speech sounds have been encountered, I've got to by then have grouped them together and thought, I know what that is. That's the word tiger. If I can't do it by then, more speech sounds are arriving, and I'm, I'm done for. And of course, we have that experience when we listen to languages we don't know or don't know very well. We have that sense of ah, it's just a pile of sound coming at me. Help! I just heard the word. You know, one word popped out at me, and then oh, I've just, just I've lost again. So you have that sort of sense of zo- zooming in and out of understanding because it's just coming too quickly for you to decode it. Now, the, the thing that is very interesting there is that that approach, that process of creating chunks, has to happen immediately. If it doesn't happen immediately, the onrushing torrent will wipe you out. But it's also a recursive thing. So you have to take the speech sounds and turn them into you know, parts of words, say syllables or morphemes or whole words. But then the same story arrives uh, applies with words. So if I give you a sequence of words, four or five words quickly, and you can hang on to that. But if I give you seven or eight, you can't, if they're arbitrary words. And, and so you, again, you've got to do the same thing. You've got to put these words into some kind of logical connection. And you've got to do that fast, because otherwise you're wiped out by the new lot that appeared. So the processing of the cat sat so you've got to think well the cat right that's a thing it's doing some sitting on the mat right okay i've got a, as an object and it's sitting on it and you've got to interpret this as the sentence is coming in because if you don't you're going to be you're going to be your mental representation of those sounds is going to be obliterated so there's a kind of chunking all the way up as it were you start with small units you have to chunk them quickly sparse if you don't do it don't, you, you, immediately you're done for that's the now or never bottleneck it's now or never to work out what what was said there I don't do it now. I'm never going to know because the on-rushing speech stream will hit me. But I've got to do that at the level of sounds to words or parts of words to words. And I've got to get words to phrases and up to whole sentences or even larger units of discourse as well. So this is hierarchy of complexity, which obviously characterizes language across every language. We all have this, but they all have this same hierarchical structure. That's sort of inherent in the, the limitations of our memories. Yeah, Morton, what do you have to say about language through the now or never bottleneck? 
Well, one, one thing that, that actually the bottleneck is even more severe than it may appear because oftentimes might feel that, oh, our minds are a little bit like digital recording devices and so on. But it actually turns out that the sound that we hear, for example, when I'm talking right now, that disappears, the actual sensory memory of it, their echoic memory, disappear within about a tenth of a second, which is incredibly fast. So if you don't do something with that sound, it's just gone. And of course, we experience that all the time. If somebody is talking and you get disrupted for a second, then suddenly... What on earth that is saying? But then you might think, well, okay, maybe we are compensating for that. We are speaking relatively slow, so sort of to accommodate those kind of limitations. But actually, it turns out that's not the case either, because on average, in a speak of English, we'll produce about 150 words per minute, which of course is many more sounds that we have to deal with. So all that together creates the now and ever bottleneck. And, and as Nick's saying, to get around it, we really have to sort of push language through that when we're trying to make sense on it. And that that influenced both how we learn language. So one of the key aspects of learning language then becomes how can we do this as quickly as possible so that we can deal with the input. And of course, learning a second language as, or coming across different languages, as Nick was mentioning. One of the hardest thing about learning a second language is sort of trying to make sense of it, the sound before it disappears. And the same is true also for sign language, as you know, we refer to sign a lot in the book. But it, of course, it's a, there's many sign languages, and the same is true for sign language as well, that if, from a visual processing perspective, we have to do exactly the same thing. Otherwise, the input is just gone. Yeah, it's really, it is amazing, right? The, when you think about it, that we're processing 150 words a minute, and very seldom, at least on the right side of 15 beers, do we just sort of break down and it's all incoherent, right? It's quite remarkable. And it, yet it all has to go through this little uh, bottleneck, you know, the, the perceptual memory bottleneck of 80 milliseconds and the, you know, working memory bottleneck of, you know, maybe a second or two for certain things and 250 milliseconds for other things. And it's funny, you know, I do work on some projects that are trying to do language understanding and not a single one of them even thinks about this idea of a series of bottlenecks that might actually be useful in producing a language that's efficient. Now, it may just be that we are, we're, we've are we done the best we can and that our language is actually terrible, but at least it's an existence proof that you know a pretty powerful language can get through these little straws and yet still be useful. And you know, probably a big part of that is this concept of the iceberg, kind of like a code book. You know, you have a five-letter arbitrary code that actually expands to a paragraph on the other side, something like that. So let's move now to just-in-time language production. Back in 2002, I read a research paper. Somebody had done a bunch of work with the Web of Science, I think. That was before Google Scholar was widely available. And they estimated that 95% of the research in computational linguistics was on language understanding and only 5% on production. And a noob to the field, I was got that's interesting. I wonder what that's all about. Presumably that's changed some with the rise of LLMs and such. But it, and, it, and it has always struck me as spooky that we don't know how we make our utterances. You know, they, they somehow just pop out. So how does this just-in-time language production, you know, fit in with your theory? And, you know, what's, just as a personal interest, what's the current state of play of researcher interest in language production versus language understanding? So. Interestingly, well, perhaps not surprisingly, you actually see a similar kind of asymmetry within the study of language as well. So, so probably about 90 plus percent of all studies are actually language understanding, language comprehension, and much less is about language production. So in a sense, we know less about language production than we do about language understanding. And Part of that has to do with it's just much harder to study. So if I want to sort of try to figure out how you understand language, how you understand sentences, I can either have you read sentences or play sentences for you, and I can test you in a variety of ways to see what you understand. But with production, if we want to generalize across different people, it's hard to sort of control things in a way that we'd like to control in psychology. But what we are suggesting with regard to the just-in-time production is the notion that, as I mentioned earlier, we oftentimes feel like we are sort of speaking into the void, that we don't really know exactly where our sentence is going to end when we start it. Nonetheless, we end up saying something that is typically grammatically correct or reasonably correct. And that is that we sort of we do the opposite of what Nick was suggesting for doing in comprehension. So we start out with a sort of a general idea of what we want to say, 
we break that down into sort of subpart intonational phrases, roughly that will fit within sort of a breath of air. Then we take those parts and we break them down into subparts. That could be either small phrases or individual words. So then continuing that process until essentially moving around sort of the inside of our mouth in order to produce the sounds. And we took an analogy from the car production industry. So the Japanese revolutionized how you make cars by essentially not building up any inventory. So because having loads of inventory is expensive. So what they would do is that they, as something needed to go into a car, it would arrive just before that. So it's just in time production and suggestion is for language too. What we want to do is that we don't want to have too many sort of parts of what we want to say sort of lying around because then they can interfere with one another because of the limitations of our memory processes. So we sort of generate the different patterns that we want to say just as we need them rather than sort of generating a full sentence and then start to say it. So we do it as we're saying it. Yeah. And so I mean, if, if we did the opposite, if we had the sort of thought in its entirety formulated how we're going to say it at the level of speech sounds, then we might say, well, now there's a string of 80 speech sounds. and Now now I'm ready to say them. But unfortunately, that string of 80 is just way too much for our memories. So it'd be useless. It's completely pointless to be storing that because I can't deal with it. So what I can say is, well, I'm going generally over here and and then you know a couple of levels down the next three sounds are these ones here they go so each each level is only pl- you've got multiple levels running at the time but each level is only running is only jumping ahead of you know, three or four items because it, that's just going to exceed our memory otherwise so you you can't yes if you have a big inventory you just you, you're gonna you're gonna fail you won't be able to manage it you'll just have total chaos it's the all 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag problem right <laughs> you know the thing that always has amazed me ever since i started thinking about the whole issue of language around 2002 is that the production side is entirely, almost entirely unconscious. You know, if you actually try to pick your words one at a time, you know, it's like you've been punched in the head a few times. Something's, and you know, and I wonder what does that say about innateness? I mean, that all, that smells an awful lot like a, a programmed capability to be able to do this chunking at different scales, get it through the bottleneck, and yet still have the whole thing coherent. That's a damn tricky problem. Pure speculation, obviously. What do you think about, do we have some genetic capacity in that area? Well, I think I think we do, but not necessarily a capacity that's specific to language. So the ability to do these complicated sort of sequence, action sequence tasks, like, for example, cooking, is similar. You've got this, you know, if you plan that your entire protocol for a meal, apart from the fact that, as Morton was saying earlier, you'd have to keep making adjustments because pans would be heavier than you expected and you know, onions would be bottom and there'd be all these adjustments you have to make. But if, even if you could plan it all out, you'd have hundreds of actions and you'd never be able to remember what any of them ever were. So you wouldn't be able to actually work that way. So what we actually do, we have this vague sense of you know, now to the source, you know, back to the oven and so on. And within that, there are all these subcomponents. So, so I think the ability to manage that is remarkable and it does seem to be not necessarily uniquely human, but something that humans are especially good at and pro- probably quite a lot better at than most non-humans, non-human creatures. But that's not necessarily, and I think we would strongly argue that it isn't, in fact, specific to language. So it's a crucial precursor for language. If you didn't have that machinery, that ability to build these complicated hierarchical sequences of actions, then there's no you know, language could never have emerged. Just to say so a tiny bit about your point about the strangeness, the true weirdness of the speaking into the void. I think that's absolutely right. And from a now never bottleneck point of view, it's sort of, or a, or a just in time production point of view, it's sort of inevitable because you, you really can't see far ahead. And there's no, it's not as if your mind just plotted the whole sentence and you're just waiting for it to emerge. I, inevitably, you are making it up as you go along. So that sense of, gosh, words just seem to be appearing. I seem to be just, pulling this stuff out of nowhere. In some sense, you are engaged in a creative process. It's not that you're, as it were, de-downloading or decoding or something it's something in your mind that you could somehow sort of look look at from outside and say, yeah, I'm halfway through the file now. Oh, there's a little bit more to go. You're you're doing you're engaged in an improvised improvised activity. And it's a bit like it's a bit like playing the saxophone or something. And you you, you can't explain what you're going to do before you've done it. You've just got to go go with it. Cool. And also the notion of just-in-time production also allows you enough flexibility so that you can react to the kind of feedback that you're getting from the people you're speaking with. And, and one of the things that, that that adds to the pressure from the now and ever bottleneck is that on during normal conversation, 
you know, the time between I say something and then some the person I'm talking to says something is on average about 250 milliseconds, which is an incredibly short time. And this is have shown to hold across cultures and across languages. And what this means is that you actually have to be very attentive to what, what the other person is saying. And you actually, we, one of the things we know from, from experimental psychology is that if I was to show you a picture and you had to say that's a cat or a dog or something, mm-hmm. that takes you about 600 milliseconds to program and be able to say that. So, so the 250 milliseconds pause between when somebody finishes their turn and another starts theirs, that means that we have to sort of try to figure out what the other person is saying of course, while they're saying it, but also actually have to figure out what we're going to say, or at least begin to say something before they finish their turn. And therefore, we need sort of maximum flexibility in order to be able to do that. Yeah, that's again, huh? How does that happen? That's pretty cool. You know, as you guys point out, the speed of the language dancing is remarkably high and give some interesting examples that it's nowhere nearly as coherent as we might think, right? There's lots of ellipsis, there's repeating, there's, you know, in, you know, in other kinds of inference. It's, I mean, if you actually look at a recorded conversation, it's like, what the hell are those people crazy, right? And that's another, you know, probably an adaptation to these bottlenecks issues. So bottleneck on one side, and it's using the iceberg, right? At least that strikes Mm -hmm. me as a reasonable explanation for how is it that this weird, crazy looking language dance actually works? Yeah. And of course, that also picks up on the point, going back to the perfect language point, it picks up on the idea that we tend so often to think, at least in the academic study of language, that written language is primary. Which is sort of obviously is I mean, written language is clearly quite recent and it's not the way none of us learn to write before we learn to speak. But nonetheless, it's often viewed as the kind of canonical form of language. And it's obviously more stable and regular and has better grammar, at least in sort of high literary culture. The sort of conversations that we have, which have all these, these ellipses and stumbles and restarts. But of course, taking this charades perspective, we should absolutely see it the other way, the more natural perspective, which is, of course, the way natural language has evolved and the way we use it all the time is this you know, chaotic jumble that allows us to get our thoughts across to other people we're interacting with face to face or over, over the internet and, or the telephone these days. And that, the fact that then you can codify that and formalize it and make it more precise and, and develop a kind of standardized, more standardized written language is a very interesting thing. But that's, you know, thinking that is the ultimate study or the, you know, the, the kind of the essence of language is a fundamental error. But actually, uh, linguists have often done that. So at least post Noam Chomsky, there's been a, you know, implicitly a great focus on what's a proper grammatical sentence spoken by a literal, not necessarily spoken, actually, really written and read by a literate speaker of the language. But the fact that we speak very differently in, in a jumbled and chaotic way is usually viewed as sort of performance error. This is just sort of marginal stuff. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that that perfect in a, a perfect language, which is somehow embodied the kind of ideal written text, but also ultimately embodied in your you know, supposedly in some sort of universal grammar in your mind. And the chaos is you know, just purely kind of noise. Whereas we want to see that chaotic improvisation as the absolute core of language. And the fact that, that it self-organizes to become somewhat structured is an astonishing thing. But it's, 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 it starts from chaos and becomes orderly rather than starting from some kind of perfection and uh, degrading. Yeah, let's bring up ahead to something I was going to do in the next section. We'll come back to what I was going to do next, which is you guys go right after the harumphers who are talk about language degrading kids today. They're destroying English, French, Russian, Greek, Chinese, whatever. You know, go, on, go after the harumphers. Give them a full shot. <laughs> well, for centuries, people have been complaining that the young people today are ruining the language and so on. But really, what that's just a reflection of is that language continuously changes as new words come in into play, new ways of saying things and so on. And that's, and that's because so we are creating language in the moment. We keep on improvising, coming up with new ways of saying things. And of course, there's always going to be some that sort of seeing this as, oh, this is not the language that I grew up speaking, so there must be something wrong with it. And there must be something, an ideal essence to the language that that it, that these new ways of saying things are sort of a deviation from. But really, what it's missing is that language is changing all the time. And in many ways, we don't really realize that that even within ourselves, that our language as throughout our life changes across time. And it's actually a really neat study of Queen Elizabeth and her vowels. So we all know that Queen Elizabeth, before she passed away, of course, would sound very posh to many people. And so that her way of producing vowels and consonants would be sort of sound posh to many. But it turns out that 
over the many years that she's that she was the queen of England, she changed her vowel. So, so what a set of linguists did, they analyzed her Christmas speeches, which she's been delivering, I think, since sometimes in the mid 60s or something, 1960s. And they recorded her vowels and they could measure this specific kind of vowels that she produced. And it turns out that over 40 years, after 40 years, she no longer spoke the Queen's English, at least when it comes to, to vowels, because her vowels had changed. So they actually ended up sounding more like the vowels that the general population would use 40 years ago. But because they had changed too, she still sounded posh. It's just that she had changed to where they were and they had changed themselves too. Interesting. Yeah, this is yeah, this is like the you know, the essence of language is it's always evolving, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And not dev not necessarily devolving. You guys made a good point, which is if we took the Harumphers seriously, then you'd have to look at, you know, the descendant languages like Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, and Icelandic that came from the old Norse as you know, barely functional, degenerate, and it's, you'd expect them to be going around Reykjavik on all fours, right? And that's just not the way the world is. Yeah, because and English, English would be in a pretty bad state, wouldn't it? Because it's this strange mixture of French and Romance German languages and French and German, such a very much language and Germanic languages kind of mushed together with influences from all over the place. So yes, I think the history of language is the history of un unwanted and frustrating change to the older generation. And we're all subject to it. It's hard not to get, get to, to, to suffer this. You hear people using a word in a way that didn't, it didn't used to be used like that when I was a boy. It's hard not to think, well, something's being lost here. The language is you know, it's suffering a terrible blow. But what, what, what one's forgetting? is that for every lost distinction, there's a new distinction. There's a, when people have to communicate something, they'll find a way to do it. And, Bo, by the way, in a world that's getting increasingly complex, it's probably not one for one. It's one and a half for one or, or two for yeah, one. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, I, I try hard, although I still do it, being a geezer. Try not to say kids today because you remember that they've been complaining about kids today, at least since the time of Socrates. And if we were actually getting worse every generation, we would be back on all fours by now. So I think language is a great case. You guys make a really good case against the Harumphers, one of the best I've ever seen. Anyway, let's get back to where we were, which is another one of the challenge in some ways it's a challenge of language but it's also evidence i suspect of your hypothesis which is the meanings for many of the tokens in the language and you guys do a really nice job a little light dance around the the phrase the unbearable lightness of meaning take it away yeah right so so many people know that the book, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, Milan Kundera. And we're taking the, the phrase, which actually a, a colleague of ours, a PhD student of ours, uh, George Dunbar at Edinburgh, we have never found this in writing, but he picked up this phrase and generated this lovely phrase, The Unbearable Lightness of Meaning, which is wonderful because I mean, what George was interested in was the amazing flexibility with which, people, with which people's categories jump around based on you know, really very ephemeral cues. So, so we riffed on this in our discussion of meaning. And I think one of the things that's rather nice is that if you think about lightness as your starting point, you think, well, what, you know, lightness is a pretty basic kind of thing. It just refers to you know, the opposite of heaviness. I mean, what's complex about that? If you just take lightness itself, you find that, of course, it has enormous numbers of meanings. So you can talk about you know, light infantry, light brigades. You can talk about light loads. You can talk about light houses in slightly different contexts. You can talk about light reds. You can talk about light music. And you see, well, what's going on here? It's this same single word, which is not an exceptional or unusual word. This has this enormous variety of uses. Now, in the charades world, this is what you'd expect, because you, you, as long as you can build some kind of conceptual and logical link between light, as in, say, for example, a light stone versus a heavy stone, if you can build some kind of conceptual and logical link between that and a light versus a heavy voice, which it appears we can, indeed, this is something that psychologists would be quite interested in, the fact that we can make these connections between quite different modalities and quite different kinds of things, but in a stable way. So it's not the case that some people think light stone corresponds to a, a, a gruff voice. And, and in fact, it's pretty stably, the heavy stone is the gruff thing and the light stuff, stone is the, is the high-pitched thing. If those things are stable, then we can use light in, in all these different contexts. And, and it's incredibly generous. Here. So it's like, the, it's, like the, it's like the King Kong. You've got a charade component, you've got a token light. And I want to, I've got some wines and I want to pick out the one that's a, a lighter, maybe flavor. And I think, well, you know, I can, I've, got a, I've got a token for this light. Let's give it a go. And if it's the case that you can make that mapping which it seems we can in a fairly, in a fairly reliable way, then I can now use it to describe 
wines, which I wasn't doing before. And so you've got this astonishing flexibility, which is only really limited by our collective, you know, collaborative creativity. I mean, we have to be creative in the same way. So I, it, it goes back to what your Stephen King point. If I'm, if one person tried to conjure up something in the mind of another, they, the conjuring up process does require that we're aligned with each other so that you know, my connection with what light, a light red or a light wine might be has to be have some link to you. But it doesn't have to be that precise because it only has to do the job of the moment. So if I say, oh, could you pass that light, the light, light red cup? We don't have to have complete agreement on exactly what light red means in all possible circumstances. We just have to know it's not that there's only two, one's dark, one's light, it's that one. So this tendency for us to continually reuse and evolve and spread out our the meanings of our words is very basic. So, so Wittgenstein, who's a great um, philosopher who, who, the language game, the title really comes from his discussions of language. I mean, we don't have a profound and uh, Wittgensteinian level of profundity in our book. I can certainly guarantee that. He's a very deep thinker indeed. But the idea of languages and communication operating in these kind of momentary games, that's, that's something that, that came from Wittgenstein. But Wittgenstein was also very interested in the idea that meanings are continually are not bound together by some common core they're bound together by, by what he calls family resemblance the family resemblance is in, in Wittgenstein's mind that each member of the family each component is just tied somehow to some other one and it doesn't have to be the same there's no common essence there's no common core and so you know once you've got the idea of a light red you can probably do a light blue and a light yellow if you say oh how are all those light colors how do they relate which may be something to do with whiteness or something or translucency. How do they relate to the different kinds of, I don't know, brigade in the military or frigates in, in, in the Navy? You might say, well, there's no real connection really, but light gets me from one one domain to another. And then in that domain, we can play around and we can go to some other domain and play around. And this sort of network of connections can take us in any direction. But what you don't get and what psychologists, linguists, philosophers have often imagined you must have, going back to the perfect language perspective, what you don't get is some kind of common meaning. That kind of answers the question, yes, but what does the word mean? You know, what is it? What is it? What's the core meaning of light? And to which the answer for Wittgenstein and for us would be, well, it's just the wrong question. There's just this network. Does it work? Is it useful, right? You know, people listen to my podcast and know that I love the word useful as a lens on things. And I don't really care if they're good or they're true or they're beautiful. Are they useful, right? And that's, we'll get a little bit later into the evolutionary ideas of language, but I'm going to put those words in your mouth that, you know, that if, if light, if one of my, if my father's generation, and when I was reading that section of the book, it reminded me of some, my father's generation, who around the end, before payday, they talk about their wallet being light, right? That was kind of a almost <laughs> literary usage of the term. And obviously the, the difference in the weight of their wallet was probably insignificant, but metaphorically it, it worked kind of in the Lake Off and Johnson kind of sense where you take the physical and you project it into some other domain. You guys also talk a little bit about how this is the way kids use language, you know, very toddlers. And I'm very focused on this because I've got a two and a half year old granddaughter who is very verbally adroit and will be arriving in about an hour and a half. And I haven't seen her in a month and I expect she's made another quantum leap in her use of language. So how do toddlers use these tokens that are highly overloaded? Well, oftentimes what happens is that it, it might seem that they know the meaning of the word in the same way that we might think that you and I know it, or at least an approximation of it. But actually, what they're doing is just trying to make sense of what you're saying in the moment. And if you ask them later on, they might actually have a very different view of it. So so oftentimes, kids might think that that dog could, for example, refer to you know, the dog in the house. But actually, if you ask them if, if a cow is a dog or a cat is a dog, they might say that too, because for them... A dog just refers to four-legged animals. And so th there's a nice study where they looked at children who in the laboratory was exposed to some new words, whether they could actually remember them. It turns out that although they could use them in the moment because they essentially just saw it as like a kind of problem solving, when they were tested later, they just didn't know the meaning, but they could use it in the moment because the context helped them to figure out what that where it is. So, so kids gradually over time sort of try to figure out what we are trying to say to them from the context in which they hear the words. And of course, they pick up that, okay, these words are typically used in this context and that, this word in that context. And they become more and more sort of amazing at that. But oftentimes, if you sort of query them a little more deeply, you'll find that they don't really have all the nuances of meaning that a word has, and but they'll get there, definitely. 
Yeah, and just to add something to that, which is an anecdote from my time at uh, Edinburgh, because both, both Morton and I were graduate students at Edinburgh University. So we do go back a long way, back to our, back to our PhDs. And one of, the, one of the talks I went to as a graduate student, which I think this is probably something like 1988 or 1987, was Susan Carey uh, at Harvard, uh, still, still, still active, who was giving a talk about young children and how different they are from what we imagine exactly in the way what I was talking about and the example that, that I remember she talked about was alive and dead so what children think is alive what they think is dead and I can't remember how old the kids were that's sort of five or six or something like that and she was talking about how you know, how incredibly metaphorical and analogical exactly in the Lake and Johnson kind of way the usage of alive and dead was and I remember my friend and often collaborator Mike Oxford who's again another same place as us as Morton and I another graduate student at the cent- then second Centre for Cognitive Science in Edinburgh, he had a five or six-year-old daughter. And so next time we were with her, <laughs> let's try this out. This can't be true. This stuff, this crazy stuff about alive and dead, it's just ridiculous. Well, let's just ask Julia, and uh, who's now, of course, a 40-year-old woman or something. It's quite, I just had his life go by so fast. And it was truly astounding. So we discovered that if you asked, you know, is a car alive? She'd say, no, 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 a car's not alive. Oh, well, not if it's going along, it's alive. But when it's static, no, it's not alive. And you discover that you know, you know, the TV's alive when it's actually on, but obviously not otherwise. And it, it was just incredible. So this sort of sense, and the sun turns out to be alive as well, at least you know, according to her. But if you said, well, what about at night times? Well, well, that was a tricky one. I wasn't sure about that. Probably sleeping, was, right? <laughs> sleeping, yeah, that's probably right. And, and she was very lucid and could give good, you know, good stories about the meanings of these words. But it was just totally not what we imagined at all. And yet the kid could communicate just fine. Absolutely. That's the, yeah, I think that absolutely. was my takeaway yeah. from this section is the stuff is way sloppier than we think, and yet it still works. I mean, it's the miracle of human communication and human intelligence, isn't it? It's not the, the miracle isn't that we're just so precise that we can get everything down pat. The miracle is that we can be so sloppy and succeed. And we have to be because the world is way too complex for us to understand it. What's inevitable when you're a small child is you don't understand the detail of meaning of dog and cat and alive and dead and all these things because the world's way too complex to, to comprehend at that age. But of course, the world's always too complex to understand. I mean, we never get, we never be able to start speaking to anybody if we had to understand the world around because it's way more complex than we can possibly ima- imagine. And yet, we can still communicate very effectively. So that sloppiness is sort of an, it's an inherent miracle of, you know, of it's inherent to the sort of miracle of communication that we can talk about a world without really knowing how the world works. All right, let's dig dig in and get a little bit more theoretical and nerd-like. This, I think, is a phrase from the book, the forces of order and disorder. This is where you start to go Santa Fe Institute on us a little bit. And I can actually see it, you know, the order and the disorder. Take it away, gentlemen. Well, shall shall I start with a few words of that? I'll hand over to Morton now. I think the starting point for, as we've talked about with the perfect language, dream. The starting point for most theorists of language is to think that that the order must be primary. So, for example, the universal, the idea of universal grammar, which is basic to, to Noam Chomsky's position, at least for a long time, it's not quite clear what his position is now. It's the idea that the basic structure of language, the basic grammar of language is genetically wired into you, quite where that genetic wiring comes from. The wiring of the brain comes from the genes, but quite where that comes from is not completely clear. But the idea is that specifies the space of possible languages in a really formal way, in a way that you can write down with the kind of symbolism you'd use to, to specify a the structure of a programming language. And the thought is that languages, the human languages, can only inhabit a kind of a small sp- space, a tiny fraction of all possible languages. And this, at least in the original, or well, not the original, but one of the best known variations of this idea in Chomsky's thinking, the idea is that you have a set of parameters, and those parameters can define a space of possible ways language can be. And the child's struggle in learning a language is just to think, well, which of these languages is it? There's a, you know, I've got a finite set of parameters. I've got all these possible languages, which are where all the real complex stuff is just wired into me. The structure's all basically in my head. Yeah, it's, you got to set the knobs on the universal grammar machine. Exactly. When I was at MIT, exactly. taking philosophy yeah. in 1977, that's how they tried to explain it to us. Yeah, exactly that. It's exactly that. Yeah, so all the complexity is built in, and you've just got to set the knobs. So the child is thinking, you know, am I in one of those languages where you can drop pronouns or not? Like, can I do that? Or is that not okay? Or whatever it is. All kinds of just specific things that differentiate one language from another. And then the alternative view, our view, is that is a sort of disorder first, order later perspective. So the idea here is that you're learning quite isolated little patterns of a language which work in particular contexts, and then gradually become, those are becoming more entrenched and more 
more connected to other bits of the language. And gradually, as you're acquiring a language, you're learning it piece by piece, kind of unit by unit, but you're gradually building more of a system. And that system becomes more and more complex, but it never becomes fully coherent. So it's not that you ever get to the point where you say, ah, oh, now we can describe that perfectly with a, a mathematical system. It's never, it never gets to that point because it's essentially a, it's a self-organizing system where the different bits of the system are self-organizing independently, but they don't quite cohere. So you know, language actually is a, is a sort of a, a riddle of strange exceptions and misconnections right through it. Every aspect of language from the sound patterns to the grammar to the meanings, there's sort of exceptions in irregularity and peculiarity everywhere. Now, to the stand, to the, to the order first perspective, this is a bit of a mystery. I mean, we've got this orderly thing in our head that we have the parameters, the knobs, and we twiddle the knobs. But then, strangely, there's all kinds of exceptions. Language seems to have you know, just exceptions everywhere and quirks and peculiarities. Where are they all coming from? Whereas from the disorder first perspective, of course, those it's chaotic to begin with. And it's still, a lot of the chaos is still there. The order is emerging, but it's not complete. So just to give one example, I should hand over to Morton. But the kind of thing you see in, in, in language all over the place is something I was thinking about today. So this is not necessarily the best example, but it was just wandering through my mind. Because it's quite cold here at the moment in, in, in Oxford. I was thinking you can say in British English, you can say it's nippy today. Or, or you can also say it's chilly today. And I can, and now that's fine, but I can say, if I want to, about myself, I'm chilly, but I certainly cannot say I'm nippy. And what's well, going on Well, you can, there? but people will think you're a little weird. They would think I was very <laughs> weird, yeah. So what, what's going on there? I mean, it, doesn't, it seems very weird, but, you know, that, but that's everywhere. And, and language is just, you know, Peter Cullicover in particular, a very notable linguist who works a lot with Ray Jackendorf, the very brilliant linguist you mentioned earlier. Peter Cullicover is, and Ray Jackendorf, both of them really have, have looked a lot that these kind of quirky aspects of language. There's a wonderful book called Simpler, sorry, Simpler Syntax by the two of them, and also Kalikova's book, Syntactic Nuts. These are just amazing. They're just full of the demonstrations of the kind of crazy semi-regularity of language. It's just, you know, every place they look, they find more of this kind of weird irregularity. So I'll hand over to Morton. Morton, order and disorder. Well, mostly disorder, but from out of that comes order. And I think one of the things that's interesting in from our notion of language being fundamentally about improvisation and collaboration, what happens is that we have these recurring patterns are used over and over again. And over time, they can even change in their nature. So, so there's an interesting part of linguistics called grammaticalization, where when certain words or word combinations are used over and over again, they can actually lose some of their normal meaning and take on additional grammatical functions. So for example, an example is the word go, which in English primarily just refer to walking, such as, you know, you know I'm, I'm going to Paris, which means I'm walking to Paris in this case. But actually what happens is that over time, because when we go somewhere, we oftentimes do something, that's generally why we go somewhere. And so it took on a more abstract meaning of describing something we wanted to do in the future, such as I'm going to eat at seven. And so many other words have undergone similar kind of processes. And so, so this begins to create some patterns of order in the disorder. On the flip side, because we are essentially trying to communicate sort of in a way that's good enough for the present purposes, it allows for all sort of flexibility and, and variation so that we don't need it to be sort of hammered down into sort of a strict sort of order based on rules and so on. And as you were referring to earlier, when you look at actual transcription of speech, it's incredibly messy, yet it does have semi, it does have sort of quasi regular patterns, the kind of patterns that we also see emerging in self organizing systems as we like, or, as I'm sure they still like to talk a lot about at the Santa Fe Institute. Indeed. And you guys give some examples about how this stuff is less stable than you might think. Even something that seems like a bedrock of language like subject, verb, object order can, can we would say in Santa Fe English, drift in its basin until it reaches a transition point and then flip over. Right? Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, so I think, I mean, if you're a speaker of many European languages, the idea that Every language must have default the subject, verb, object order seems very natural. But actually, subject, verb, object isn't even the most common word order for languages of the world. So I, I believe VSO, verb, verb, subject, object, is the most common. Is that right, Morton? I'll double check that. No, it's SOV. V, S -O -V, v, -O -V, v -O -S -S is, is definitely not. 
<laughs> SOV. Right, yeah. no, that's in bonkers, yeah. SOV. So, so it's actually more common to actually have the verb at the end of the three. So, so it feels like something that you'd think would be very, very sort of standardized, but in fact, it, it isn't. And interestingly, a lot of languages are actually very free in the word order they use. So, so famously Latin, where you have cases, the cases that basically tell you who's the subject, who's the object. So the cases are actually doing the work of the word order. So there in Latin, you can play quite freely with work, with the word order, not completely freely, I think, not that I'm any expert, but pretty freely. And as time goes by, it turns out that, in, in for example, there are other very much languages descended from Latin, a particular word order, SVO, becomes established. And then you can start to throw away all that case information. You don't need the verb, the, word, the, the noun endings, which are telling you, I'm the subject or I'm the object. You don't need that anymore because now you've got word order to do that for you. So, so it turns out that your word order as a kind of crucial clue to who's doing what to whom is actually is something that doesn't always arise in the languages at all, at all and often is rather a late entry. But also, indeed, as you say, Jim, languages can change their word order as well. So I'm no expert on this, but I think with German, there was a major shift at some point in the Middle Ages, and I, I can't reconstruct the nature of it, I'm afraid. But these shifts do occur. So yeah, yeah, there's this, this, even something that seems sort of incredibly natural to us. If you're a speaker of one language, how could it be different? In fact, it's something that's much more labile than you think. And so probably some of them were frozen accidents. Some particularly verbal nine-year-olds started doing it one way, and it stuck. You know, it's one of the things I think a useful lens of the Santa Fe Institute way of thinking is how much of our world is frozen accidents of one sort or another. Well, let's move on to a big topic. We spent some time on this one. Is what you guys call language evolution without biological evolution, and I guess that strongly contrasts with people like Pinker and Bloom. I don't know if they still do, but they used to claim. Prometheus, the man of language, suddenly appeared magically out of the head of somebody 100,000 years ago. You don't think that's true. So tell us how we can get language evolution without biological evolution. Well, the Prometheus story was actually Chomsky's idea that it's sort of about 100,000 years ago, suddenly there was in, in some of our descendants and the ability to form structure in a particular way would have merged in that person and then would have been sort of carried down through descendants. Pink and Bloom suggested that we would gradually have changes in our brains to accommodate sort of a sort of a genetic endowment for language. Now, both of these two stories we don't find very likely for a number of reasons. One of them is the fact that when we think about biological evolution and cultural evolution, language, you know, changing as quickly as we talked about, that's part of cultural evolution, but biological evolution is much, much slower on the order of, you know, hundreds of thousands or years of more. And so what's happening is that because language changed so quickly, it provides essentially a moving target for the genes to follow, so to speak. And we've, in fact, we've conducted all sort of computer simulations in order to underline that. But but I think we, we think they sort of gotten the question the wrong way around. So the question that Chomsky and Pinker and Bloom are asking is, you know, how come the brain is so well adapted for language? Well, we are suggesting instead that given the speed of cultural evolution, what we should ask instead is, why is language so well adapted to the human brain? And here we have this idea of language as a self-organizing adaptive system that is adapting to the human brain, to the way we interact, to the human body, and so on. So over time, the reason why we see this sort of reasonably good fit between our brains and the languages we speak, it's not because our brains have adapted for that, but rather that languages themselves have adapted almost like little organisms to our brains. Yeah, that was a powerful lens when I read that. I go, Aha! That's a really big idea. Yeah, no, and I think just to amplify that, if you think about the divergence of human populations since we since we left Africa, we have been you know, spreading out in a rather chaotic way across the globe for a long time. And there are many populations which have been dispersed and had no, little contact for 50,000 years or more. So if you take people who are native to Aust Australasia and look at people who are native to Europe, their, their common ancestry would be going back 40 or 50,000 years at least. Now, if you imagine, so the, if you imagine that there was some kind of coevolution going on between culture and biology, which is the Pinker and Bloom kind of story, there's some kind of incremental ratchet-like cultural interplay between the development of language and that's somehow getting 
we're bedded down into the genes. We're adapting to the language we're speaking, and then the language changes more, and then we adapt to that. So there's a kind of co-evolution story. If that were right, then we would expect that it should be really tricky for, for example, people with a native Australi- Australasian heritage. They should struggle to learn English, and vice versa. You know, people with Australasian backgrounds should find it very difficult to learn Aboriginal languages. But that's just totally wrong. They're basically, anyone can learn any language, any baby brought up anywhere. It seems to be pretty much identically good at learning any language. And so it seems like if there was ever this cultural evolution, and sorry, biological and cultural interplay, it sort of mysteriously stopped. In fact, it stopped as soon as human populations started to diverge. Because if it didn't, if it, was, if it happened after any divergence in human population, we'd find there would be these weird difficulties in learning different kinds of languages because the, those different biological populations would, would have been evolved to those specific languages. And that's just completely not the case. So it seemed much more pre- credible, in fact, the only real story that makes sense, I think, from an evolutionary point of view, that there really hasn't been substantial biological evolution, which is specific to the way languages have been created. So we, if we evolved a language as a cultural object, then we'd all be We'd all be evolved to different things around the world, but we're not. We're all able to speak any language. So, so it, the, basically, the, the biology comes first. The precursors, the biological precursors, and the sort of foundations on which language is built, they come first. They're not adapted to language. They emerged before language appeared. But then we can build this cultural machinery on top. In the same way that we obviously can, for example, with writing. We can obviously all we can all read and write, but nobody thinks, God, this is an amazing world this reading and writing. There must be you know, some kind of genes for it. But obviously there can't be because writing was only invented a few thousand years ago and hardly anybody in human history wrote or read until a few hundred years ago. So yeah, clearly that's wrong. Um, the same story, and then you could say the same story for mathematics or music or any other cultural form. And I think the same story is true for language. These, these cultural forms are building on biology. They're not the biology is not being shaped around them or there's no genetic endowment for language or for writing or for music or anything else. And actually, reading is a good example, our ability to read is a good example for thinking about some of the potential counter arguments to this notion that we don't have a genetic or a sort of brain-based endowment specifically for language. Because one of the arguments sometimes comes from that we see language breakdown, for example, following strokes in particular areas like Broca's areas and so on. And we also see there are certain genes like FOXP2 that seem to affect language ability. But interestingly, we see the same thing for reading. So in the case of reading, there are genes that have been suggested to play a role in affecting reading ability leading to dyslexia. And we also see that they can be damaged in certain parts of the brain that can lead to dyslexia as well. Yet, we also know that, as Nick was saying, because reading has only been around for about 7,000 years or so, and during most of that time, there's only been a very small subset of the human population that's been able to read. And so we are arguing something similar is true for language, that because language is a cultural product like reading, the fact that we can see specific patterns of language breakdown, for example, in damage to certain parts of the brain, or that we can see certain genetic conditions affecting language ability, that doesn't necessarily mean that these genes or these areas of the brain have evolved specifically for language. Yeah, there's some great arguments in the book on how the Fox P2 stuff and the mutations on it are a pretty strong argument that there isn't much current, at least, evolution going to support the, especially the different languages. And I think that you guys did a great job of laying that research out. It convinced me, and I'm a skeptical son of a bitch, right? <laughs> we're going to, there's some other very interesting topics here, which unfortunately we're not going to have time for. N learning versus C learning, shelling points, why Danish is so goddamn hard for people to learn. I didn't know that it was, but apparently it is. And some riffing on Sapper Wharf, everybody's favorite topic. But we got to leave a few minutes for the hot topic of the day. So anyway, read the book and you can see, read all those good things. But we're going to have to leave 10 minutes here at the end to talk a little bit about the hot topic of the day, which is what you guys know about language and what does that tell us about things like chat GPT and other approaches to AI meets language? Yeah, I mean, this is really interesting. And obviously, it's breaking break, breaking news almost as the book was coming out. We had some discussion of GPT-3, which is the machinery inside chat GTP. So the thing that is really, I mean, it's an incredible piece of technology. It's just amazing that it's possible to build a, try to train a neural network on what is essentially you know, pretty close to the whole of the web. And that it's actually able to distill anything useful out of that to the extent that you can write. You can, it can read, well, you know, write bits of computer code, write stories, write 
what when we talk about poems in a moment. It can do all of this kind of stuff at really quite a high level. It can, you know, to some extent, translate from one language to another. I mean, it's just you know, an incredible technical achievement, and it's quite remarkable. It's one of the relatively, it's sort of the opposite of what used to happen in AI, where there'd be a huge amount of over-promising and nothing would actually happen. And now everyone's thinking, well, you know, these neural networks are pretty cool, but they're you know, fairly limited. And suddenly a breakthrough piece of technology is created, which does all kinds of things that you know, no one really expected it could, I suspect including its own creators. So it's just astounding. But it's worth remembering that what it is doing is something like an incredibly clever and incredibly cl- sophisticated cutting and pasting and mutating of language that's already already lying around on the web. So if you want a story in the style of Jerome K. Jerome, which is an example we talk about in the book, and you want it to be on the subject of Twitter, it will amazingly write you a story. And the first paragraph, at least, it starts to degenerate a bit, but the first paragraph is it's actually pretty funny and pretty pretty well well done. But what it's doing when it's doing that is doing it's doing something which is it, it, it purely involves reprocessing, repackaging, and resynthesizing chunks of material that are already lying around. So there'll be bits of Jerome K. Jerome, there'll be lots of discussion of Twitter. It's all being sort of reutilized and blended and melded together in, in a really a remarkable way. I mean, you know, it's astounding how it's doing it. I mean, literally, the curators won't know either. It's, it's mysterious and astounding. But it's doing that without any understanding of the world at all. It doesn't know what Twitter is. It doesn't know what, who Jerome K. Jerome is. It doesn't know what the topics it's, it talks about. It starts to talk about to the Twitters, the, the talk of all London. And one of my recent trip, trips to the coast, I heard everyone tweeting like starling cages or whatever it was. So it produces this lovely story. It doesn't have any understanding of any of this. And we can see that when clever computer scientists start to probe what it does when you give it nonsense. If you give it nonsense, if you start to ask it questions like, well, how many eyes does a spider have? I think the answer is eight, and it tells you eight, no problem. If you answer how many eyes does, for example, a sock have, or a foot, or a star, or whatever else you like, it'll give you an answer to that too. It'll have a go. It doesn't think, well, that's nonsense, isn't it? I mean, a foot doesn't have any eyes at all. What are you talking about? But it doesn't know that. It will look around in the corpus, pull together the best it can. And similarly, you can ask it questions such as how many, I can't, this isn't quite the right phrases, but something like how many harumphs does it take you to get to Hawaii? And it'll say 15 or whatever. <laughs> it'll make you a bloody sentence saying, oh, it takes about 15 harumphs to get to Hawaii. This is like gibberish. But again, it makes sense when you see what it's doing. It's melding language in very clever ways. Yeah, do a predictive sequence, right? And which, which is, it's yes. amazing what it does, but it's also amazing what it doesn't because it's not grounded in any actual knowledge of the world. It, it doesn't know how to, doesn't have any logic. It can only can do arithmetic by accident, basically. You know, it can do two digit addition, but not three or four. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's very interesting. But it's funny when I was, when I've been thinking about this show, we were talking about this, I figured, there's probably something that LLMs are saying that's related to your ideas mm-hmm. from the mind is flat. Have you given that any thought? Yeah. I'll just say a tiny bit on that. I, I feel I also must give some space for Morton to tell, it, talk, tell us about the GPT-3 poems, because that's so cool. But on the mind is flat, then yes, I think you're absolutely right, Jim. The idea of the mind is flat is that the is you should be suspicious of the idea that we have a sort of deep models of the world. And in fact, a lot of the time we are improvising in a very superficial way. And I think what these large language models like GPT-3, um, ChatGPT, are doing is they're showing how far you can get with a really shallow approach. Now, we're not that shallow. We are reasoners. We do understand the aspects of the world. But we're pretty shallow in the sense that we don't have, you know, if you are, certainly if you ask me to really explain what I mean by a cup, but what's a cup versus a mug or you know, forces or what gravity is, or I, you know, I don't really know the answer to any of these things. I can somehow blunder <laughs> around my daily life. Yeah. But if you prod anywhere, you know, things collapse pretty quickly. And I think chat GPT-3, chat GPT is a kind of illustration of how far you can get actually with remarkable flatness, but it's much, much flatter than we are. Okay. Morton. Martin, take it away. Talk about large language models and related AI language technologies and what you know about language. Well, so, I, you know, it's completely true what Nick is saying, that they don't really understand what they're saying. And I think that is sort of one of their fundamental shortcomings. Yet they can produce, you know, very human-like text. I think one of the things that has really struck me with these models is that we can see, we can sort of kind of construe them or view them as sort of kind of a super learner, somebody who loves, learns from experience alone, but without sort of the other kind of constraints that human have in terms of living in the world, understanding how it works and so on. And I think in that sense, one of the things I've noticed is that when you look at almost any example from GPT-3 or chat GPT, you'll notice that what they say is always grammatical. 
So what we have here, we have an existence proof, I think, of it's possible to learn grammatical language on par with human abilities from experience alone. Now, clearly, it gets loads and loads of experience, much more than what people would normally do. Nonetheless, it's sort of in the limit, an existence proof of that. Now, another thing that, that we've been playing around with some of my students and colleagues is, can we get it to produce poetry? And we actually got a little grant to look at this. Now, initially, when we started out doing this, we were very disappointed because it turned out that GPT-3 couldn't rhyme. And so that limits the kind of poetry you can do. And we tried to do all sort of manipulation of it in order to get it to rhyme, and it didn't work. But then they created a new one, a new version called Instruct GPT that came out last year in February or so. And that model, they're trying to fix some of the problems that it has. Because it's trained on what's on the internet, it would oftentimes say things that were racist or sexist or in other ways upsetting to some people and to, to a lot of people, in fact. And so what the company behind GPT-3 tried to do was to have humans actually give it feedback on its productions and then to try to correct for that. Now, as I can only imagine is an unintended consequence, it learned how to rhyme. And I have no idea why that is. Yeah, I was like completely blown away. Suddenly it could rhyme. So suddenly we, what we could do is that we could give it some examples of Shakespeare and then ask it to continue in the style of Shakespeare and it would do including rhymes. We could get it to do Emily Dickinson, Lord Byron, and a number of other poets, and suddenly could do that. And so what we tried to do is doing sort of a poetry Turing test where we show some of these completions to – I've done that in several presentations and asked the audience, no, is this robo-Shakespeare or Shakespeare? And people are essentially a chance. They can't really dis – distinguish between the two. Now, that, of course, makes sense if there's just a general sort of a general audience of, say, computer scientists or psychologists. But even when I presented it for people in the humanities, you oftentimes get that sometimes a particular fragment, they're pretty sure that this is the author. It's not. And so what we're interested in is trying to see, can we, by using all sort of computational tools, find out are there any differences in the kind of completions that GPT-3 produces compared to the human authors? And can that tell us something about what may be unique to human poetry production compared to what we see in GPT-3? But GPT-3 is an amazing statistical learner picking up on all sorts of patterns. And a lot of the way we produce language is based on such patterns too. But we have the advantage, of course, is that we have meaning. We understand what we are saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, while you were saying that, just for fun, I fired up ChatGPT and said, write a limerick that uses the name Chater and Christensen. <laughs> there once was a man named Chater whose wit was both quick and greater. He met a fair lass. <laughs> Christensen was her class. Together they made quite the pair, comma, later. I go, Tilt. <laughs> well, better than better than I could have done. But, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I was hoping it would be better and fouler than that, but it wasn't. I probably should have said and be as foul as possible. <laughs> but <laughs> but it did rhyme with uh, it did brute, rhyme. For, with yeah. brute force and total disregard of logic with the last line. But, yeah, but that's yeah. No, it, it can say nonsensical things, but it can still rhyme, and it tends to be grammatical when it just writes in general, which is really amazing. You, know, you mentioned Shakespeare. Now you mentioned rhyming in Shakespeare. And when I hear Shakespeare, I think of prosody, right? Famously writes his plays in iambic pentameter. You know, why would somebody do that? Can ChatGPT do prosody as well? To a certain degree, it can sort of pick up on some of it, not all of it. So, so my colleague who is working with me at this, who is you know a poet himself, he certainly think, no, this is bad, and so on. For me, it because I'm not a bit sort of connoisseur of poetry. I can't always see it. But for example, if you look at somebody like Emily Dickinson, she had a particular way of using punctuation and so on. And it's doing that. It was actually doing that even before it could rhyme. So, which is quite interesting. It definitely has picked up on some of these things. And for Shakespeare too, it, it's sort of not always getting right. And sometimes it's getting it wrong, but it, it seems quite reasonable for, you know, for the untrained observer, as it were. 
Got it. Well, I want to thank Nick Chater and Morton Christensen for a really interesting conversation. You want to go deeper? Go get their book, The Language Game, How Improvisation Created Language and Changed the World. That one's got a Jim Rutt recommendation next to it. So thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Jim. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, it really has been. Yeah, thank you so much. It was real fun. Audio production and editing by Andrew Blevins Productions. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.